So, how many of you, uh, I saw a lot of hands, are entrepreneurs? How many want to be social entrepreneurs? Change the world? Yes? Well, I didn't think I was going to be one of those. As you can tell, it's not blonde hair, it's gray hair. And no one actually told me when I went through school and university that I was going to end up running a large social purpose enterprise. And uh, as it says here, reflections of an accidental social entrepreneur. Uh, like Kenneth, I get up at four in the morning. You're not alone, Kenneth. Um, and no one told me that my career for the last three years was going to be about solving that. Solving the fact that there are over 100,000 families all year, every year, that are restarting their lives. And that's what they wake up to. So no one told me what it was going to be like to take all those entrepreneurial business skills that I grew up with, experienced, and then bring them into a charity who had a business within it. So what I wanted to do is, you know, uh, 18 years in business, startups, growth companies, internet.com, Ainsworth, Kenneth, I totally understand where you're coming from. But I was this odd fella who had an MBA. I was in, dropped in to, for shareholders, special project, go make us a lot of money. And I would go and do it, and then I'd move on to the next thing. But it wasn't me. And I wasn't really clear on who I was actually meant to be. And to say it was this beautiful Cinderella story that I had this moment of reflection, no, I fell into it. And while I watched all my friends head off on the left-hand side there and go chase a lot of money, I randomly, in an accidental way, ended up being recruited to come and take over operating a charity. Now, charity, entrepreneurship, those two things usually don't go hand in hand. I understand. But I took the plunge January of 2014, and I joined a social enterprise. How many of you have heard of Furniture Bank before me? Excellent. When I started the job, one in a hundred. So we're getting better. <laughs> the chairman, when I took the job, said, we're the best kept secret in Toronto. That is not what you want to be if you're a charity. <laughs> but I took the job. And uh, it, so Furniture Bank, now close your eyes. Imagine 5,000 families. Now, 5,000 families have no furniture. Housewares, beds, sofas, you name it, everything you have in your home, they don't have. For A to Z of reasons they may not have it, we don't care. We work with referring agencies across the GTA. Our job is to convince people like you, when you upsize, downsize, your wife says you're getting a new dining room set, you're putting your parents into a retirement home, or any of the hundreds of reasons you may be upgrading your furniture, if your couch is still great, if your dining room set is still great, if your mattresses are still perfectly good to sleep on, I need to find all that furniture. Last year, it was five million pounds of furniture. How many of you have friends who will get in a truck and move five million pounds of furniture? No one. And that is what the charity set up as a social enterprise in 2004. We, we have a junk, when you heard it got junk, you've seen junk companies. I always refer to it as we are when you heard it got junk, only we're picky. I will only come for nice, beautiful furniture that still has life. And every day when I took this job and I started in 2014, we had five trucks on the road. Three would go to homes like yours, and our guys would remove the furniture from your home. We would issue you a tax receipt. And then the next day, it would go onto our showroom floor. Families would come in, about 20 families, and they would be building their home piece by piece. And the next day, it would be delivered to their home, and they would move on with their lives. So, at the time, our social enterprise itself covered 50% of our operating proceeds, what we needed to operate. 44 employees, 26,000 square foot warehouse. Now, I'm thinking, it's a business. Should be easy to follow. Charity, there's some legal stuff, but I can figure that out on my own. But what I wanted to do is not spend the time so much on how I got to be here, but what I learned running a social purpose enterprise they don't teach you in the books. You can Google, you can go to all sorts of seminars. These are 10 things that I've observed over the last three years that if you intend to be a social entrepreneur and you intend to grow it to be large and complicated like Ainsworth and Kenneth have, you need to be aware of and embrace. 
They're not bad. I may depress a few of you, but that's OK. Number one, your customers don't care. I know you want them to. I want everybody to care that furniture is important. You're all sitting on furniture. You love it. You know it. But your customers, if you're selling a social enterprise, only care about service. The research very clearly states, in my case, I have to match the service level of one in her got junk, an international, multinational company, service, price, speed, all those things. And then, and only then, will most consumers say, oh yeah, and they're helping people. I'll take my dollars and put it with your social purpose enterprise, your charity. It's unfortunate. That makes it hard. Another thing, who's heard of a bottom line? You all should put up your hand. You've heard of bottom line. <laughs> Kenneth, Kenneth was first. Problem is, is when you run a social purpose enterprise, a charity not-for-profit, this is the standard your stakeholders hold you to. You get three bottom lines. Some not-for-profits don't look at the planet yet. In our case, moving five million pounds of furniture we represent if we didn't remove it from your homes, 1% of all of GTA's uh, garbage. So the city of Toronto likes us a lot, because rather than driving down to London, we remove it. And people will hold you accountable for these things. Now this leads to a very tricky and dangerous thing. And thankfully, I have my laser pointer. Uh, you are here. Is you are going to get trapped between your mission and profit your mission and revenue. So I refer to it as you will confront your dark side. I am a CEO of a charity. My mission is to solve poverty as best I can with my, in my charitable mandate, period. But there are always decisions, partnerships, processes, choices that I have to make. Do I lay off a person? Do I serve another client? And this is, it's a, sl a slippery slope and you will confront it every single day every year, it will never end. Your stakeholders, well, and this is where customers do care, by the way. Customers will always expect you to err on the side of your mission. I took the charity over in 2014. What I discovered two weeks into the job is they'd lost $300,000 the previous year. I didn't know that. So now, survive or make money. So it's a complex issue. It's not something that's easily solved. The silver bullet, who's heard of the silver bullet? We all love silver bullets. Social enterprise is the silver bullet. Ainsworth knew that. Just pop up a social enterprise, bam, solves all your problems. It doesn't. When you have a social enterprise, it is only one part of your entire organization. At Furniture Bank, we have a fleet of trucks. Our primary purpose is clients in need. We have an employment program. We have a workshop. We have a community volunteer group. We have uh, high school volunteers. We have uh, positions all over the place. We work with the Toronto Enterprise Fund. We with, work with 96 different agencies. All of those stakeholders, we have to invest time and energy and resources and staff to make sure each one of those is growing and getting better. Those are people, if you can't see. And it's a big arrow. Success is going to involve more than you. I've met lots of would-be social entrepreneurs like, I want to do it. And I, I love you. I compel it. It is so important for more of us to get involved in social entrepreneurship. Problem is, is that you need lots of people. I have a very supportive board. I could not have done what I personally have done in the last three years without a board that supported me. Staff who wanted to buy into my crazy idea of doubling down on the social enterprise to save the charity. Volunteer groups. Partners, Toronto Enterprise Fund has been a funder of ours for 13 years, and without them, the charity wouldn't be around today. You have to keep all of these stakeholders working with you, in alignment with you, rather than counter purposes, because as Ainsworth highlighted, they don't always go hand in hand. They don't always line up neatly with what you would like them to do. Great Swiss Army knife. In our case, we have, when I got to Furniture Bank, we had 44 employees. Not all of them understood what running a business was. Some of them understood the mission. Some of them understood the cause. Some of them understand volunteering. But when I got there, if you've read 
Jim Collins's book, Good to Great. He talks about me as the executive director being the bus driver and making sure that you get into that seat because you're better over there and we shuffle all of you around and the great people get put in the right seats. Some of you get moved to bigger seats because you have potential. The lady who runs the social enterprise today, it's a $1.5 million activity, used to be in the call center answering phones. Some people won't get it. The natural tension between running a charity, not just a not-for-profit and a business, is a natural and constant tension. And some people, I had to ask to leave. So you want to make sure that you, A, are prepared to teach. You have to constantly give people opportunities to grow. And you have to be aware that it's not going to work out for every single person you have with you. Take a moment to see what's wrong with this picture. It's nearly a bridge, right? Something wrong with it. None of us would drive on it, right? So what I discovered in, in larger organizations, this is a very, very significant problem. You must communicate clearly. And when you think you've communicated, you have to communicate again. I can't effectively tell everybody, all 46 employees as we have here today at Furniture Bank, what's going on. I have fundraisers, I have people on trucks, I have people in the call center, in the warehouse, I have people out in the community doing volunteer activities. They may all generally say, we're totally on board with the mission, and they are. But Noah, who's on social media right now, probably tweeting up about Furniture Bank, it's not me, um, his idea of what Furniture Bank is going to be three years from now, and Naveen's who's at a fundraising, and Andrew, who's one of the truck drivers, aren't necessarily in alignment. And if you're going to be a great social entrepreneur, you have to make communication one of your primary activities day to day. <coughs> Who has an idea for changing the world? So some social enterprise idea, some concept of making the world better. Kind of like this, right? Nice and simple. I start here, I do stuff, and lo and behold, society is corrected. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, more or less. I thought this would be how my first year of running the charity was going to be too. It's, you know, it's easy. We have existing relationships, we have a business, do this, do that, bingo bango, charity's on its way. No, nope. sorry, your vision is wrong. <laughs> you will live this life. This is you, and these are all the adventures you're going to have. Now, in my reality, the lost 300,000 were the boulders. The, um, oh yeah, we started to actually do marketing in 2014. Novel concept, we told the world we existed. We read it our website, we got into social media, did, did the typical things a business would do. But then uh, Tammy, who was doing the trucks, said, Dan, um, we need more trucks. Now these are big trucks. These are 22 foot trucks. These are 85 grand a pop. Now a charity that's lost a bit of money, walking into a bank to say, you know, that last, that, that's, that's a rounding error. I need some money to buy another truck. <laughs> but that's what I had to do. So that was this funny rope bridge. Um, the, the blue, the little, where the shark and stuff is, March of 2015, you probably, for those who heard of Furniture Bank, you probably heard us then. We had seven trucks by then. I successfully got the truck. All of our trucks are vandalized. Saturday morning, we woke up and every single one of our trucks was offline, which meant half my revenue was gone. And what I didn't know at that moment is it wasn't going to come back for two months. So when payroll's every two weeks and revenue's not coming for two months, it was the, the charity was at stake. Vandals, uh, catalytic converters, those things on the bottom of every car that soak up pollution. On trucks, they're worth a lot, about 20 grand, brand new. Vandals came in, snip, snip, 15 minutes, bingo, bango, out they go. So um, we woke up Sunday morning. We had 25 families plus appointments who were expecting their furniture to start their new lives with at home. We had donors who were prepared to give us furniture, and we had to deal with it. Now, good news is I'm still standing here, which means we succeeded. Uh, we had uh, Hino, who is our truck manufacturer. The CEO in Japan heard about the vandalism and prioritized delivery of the, our truck parts within two weeks. 
We had Leon's, we had the community, back to those, you know, work with the community, work with your stakeholders. They all came out of the woodwork. Not a single client, not a single donor was affected. And we actually made money that month, even after the insurance deductibles. So, good. And then this last one here is, we've run out of space. You'd think 26,000 square feet's a lot of space, but when you have 11 trucks, and five of them on the road picking up, plus all the drop-offs, plus all the deliveries, we're out of space. Problem is, is that while we may support 5,000 families this year, there are 20,000 families just here in the greater Toronto area that need this type of support. If you're a refugee family, you start with nothing. If you're a woman and child, we're reestablishing life after fleeing abuse, you start with nothing. And every single one of a whole A to Z of reasons, we're here for that one moment where you don't have 5,000. How many people have $5,000 sitting free in their bank account ready to spend on furniture right this second? Yeah, it's usually that way. And that's what we do every day. We provide about $5,000 with a secondhand furniture, which is great, so that they can move forward with their lives. I met a lady named Sandra, you know, in terms of, as Ken was saying, why do I do this? Sandra personally thanked me, not that I was there at the time, but thanked me and the organization. She got to keep her children, because she could show the courts that she had a home. And from the court's perspective, a home is equal to furniture, not these things, these walls, these ceilings. That's not a home, that's shelter. And she thanked me personally in the middle of a grad seminar that she brought the whole room to a standstill because people were saying furniture isn't important. So you're going to run into challenges, good and bad, and you have to be resilient enough to push through and take advantage of the opportunities and overcome the challenges. You gotta love risks. Anybody who's going to become a social entrepreneur is more than just opening up a business and making money. If you fail making money, you fail yourself. If you fail a social enterprise, you're out to try and change the world. My staff, my team, my volunteers are trying to end furniture poverty across this country. Coast to coast, not a single person should be sleeping on the floor. That's a very bold idea, but that's what we're trying to do. And we know we may fail, that's the shark. Failing is the shark. And we know it's going to be a ride, that's the wave. But you have to embrace it, you have to want to do that. And this is one I've started to no notice. This is all you budding social entrepreneurs. You want to make sure you avoid heropreneurship. This is not my, I did not coin this. But I've noticed and I've met that sometimes, and I think Kenneth, you touched on it earlier, it's not about me. Yes, I am run the charity, but I am Furniture Bank. My staff is Furniture Bank. For a number of people, I've met some social entrepreneurs, they want to do it to have the status of running it like a startup. I am, I am here to change the world. And you have to be m mindful. When you're here to solve society's issues, it's not about you. Anybody depressed yet? So why do I do it? Well, this year, this is one of our refugee families. We've had over 120 families come through Furniture Bank in the last six months. Um, these are large families. This is one of the small ones. Um, the story of this family is, if you go to Furniture Bank, you can read about it. Um, you don't really understand how bad war is until you actually meet people who survived it. Um, this year, uh, when I started, we supported about 2,300 families build homes, create homes. This year, with all of the trucks, all the staff, all the volunteering, we haven't raised staff very much, going from 44 to 48, but we'll have doubled our social impact by expanding our social enterprise, going from five trucks to 11 trucks. And thank you to the United Way for helping us get our 11. Um, every day I come in and I know the efforts and the energy and getting up at four and having two venti americanos, rather than just making money for shareholders, I get to change and make this country a little better, bit by bit. I can't save the whole, all of Canada, but I'm going to do my part to make sure the, the legacy I leave my kids is a little better. And you will notice, now that pay attention to these trucks, you'll see 11 of them on the road. And we're always out. If you see them, they're out picking up or delivering furniture to, to homes. We're oh, it's out there already. You just like skip through my... Okay. 
Um, I'm not going to read these. These are the myths that I went, ran through during these slides. And these are the countering truths. And if you are on Twitter, these are readily available. You can take a photo if you want, but they are available on Twitter. And with that, thank you. Don't forget Furniture Bank when you're getting rid of your gently used furniture. I know I sound like Bob Barker, but, <laughs> but thank you.